Okay, let's fucking do this. It's the Endless Honeymoon Podcast. My name is Moshe Kasher, and I have taken over at the as the exclusive host of the Endless Honeymoon no! Podcast. Natasha has been removed due to violation of terms of service because she went full tits out at the Los Angeles Improv. Natasha, you broke the internet. Come on now. I'm serious. I got people texting me saying, I saw your lady's titties the other night. Uh, well... Punk rock icon, feminist congrats, icon. Congrats, honey. Legend. Legend of the game. Perky tits. You know what? I'm so... I, I was doing a sober January because... Um, Sanuary. Because um, I'm a big Joe Rogan fan. Yeah. And all, all of us Rogan heads do that. Yeah. No, that's what you made fun of me. I just decided... But anyway, I was just... I have like a clarity. Oh, you're feeling mentally clear right now? <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Like if I had had like two glasses of wine at the improv following Bert... I probably wouldn't have taken my shirt off after him. Wait, you're saying you have more inhibitions after a couple glasses of wine? Well, because I wouldn't have trusted myself. I would have been like, oh, I'm like probably huh. tipsy. I'm not going to do that. But I was like, that would be so funny if I just follow him and take off my shirt too, because it's so hard to follow someone who takes their shirt off. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. I got a big react, bigger reaction than my jokes. <laughs> no, honey, your jokes are I great. get why people do it. Uh, I that's why I'm thinking about going uh, schlong first. I mean, you could. You think so? You think it's big enough? Honestly, and I know the listeners have been asking about my size. Natasha, you're an expert. Would you say it's big enough to be able to uh, perform on stage with it fully out? I would say it's pretty much very equal to the microphone. To this mic? Yeah. It's not just... No, but, but not this actual... Uh, this, this extra part right here mm -hmm. where the plug goes. I would say starting from this part... To the tip. Hey, no, that's short. And the tip would be your balls. Wait. Actually, it's... like it's, this big. No, honey. And maybe like... No. As thick as the thickest part of the Oh, mic. thank you, dear. Appreciate that, by the way. Jews, above average girth, average length. But what I wanted to get into was... Wait, that's been proven? That's been proven scientifically, yeah. Okay. I believe it was Dr. Mengele that first proved that. Anyway... Uh, Natasha, how does it feel to be the um, the hottest comedian on the internet right now? Uh, well, I don't have the Instagram app anymore, so mm -hmm. I don't really feel it. Well, uh, you have... I deleted the app. You have turned into a bit of a... Uh, you, Natasha called me from the road and she said, I think I should become a monster. No, I didn't say that. I said, my new goal mm -hmm. is to become 1% monster. Yeah. It's, just to get stuff done and not to anyone beneath me, only the people who are above me who I need help from. Mm -hmm. If I can just be like, because I always think it's so superior to be like a really nice person because I kind of used to be a bitch for like the first 20 years of my life. Right. I was like a brat until I was too old to be called a brat. Then I was just called a bitch. Uh -huh. that's <laughs> sure. That's the transition. And then when I was like 23, I was like, oh, and then I read like, Road less traveled. I wrote some. I read some like self help books, and you know. Then I've been medit on this meditation journey for twenty years, and I love to chant and self reflect. And I always think like of myself as almost being. I, I always think the superior way to always be acting is like the most kind way. You know, but you figured kind. out that that's not true in the last few days. Well, not necessarily that. I just think that all of us, if in a career, especially, and by the way, yes, you don't want to be a monster to people beneath you. You want to chomp up. Right? Yes, I want to chomp up. Yeah. Like, especially for women, if you can somehow harness 1% monster, mm -hmm. I feel like I could just like get more done. And I already, I went on a rampage the other day. I made four phone calls of people who are like slacking, not doing their job. Mm, Laura, I'm paying them. Laura, they're helping me with stuff, Laura. but they're, Always, I'm like on the, I'm like at the bottom of the list, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think just by like telling people like this is, this Captain. is unacceptable, calling them saying, Hey, listen, I know we emailed about this. I just want to make sure, you know, this is unacceptable. And if it happens again, Ooh. I'm not going to be able to keep employing you, but let me tell you something. You did a great job and you do do a great job. I love working with you, but I just want you to know I'm serious. I made like four of those calls and I have to say, my life is better. Interesting. Getting, get, I'm getting more out of things. Huh. You know, I have a suggestion for you. By the way, I love this new you, right? You don't drink. You're, you're, you're. Well, uh, I'm going to start drinking again. I was just trying to like you don't take drink. a month of sobriety because I've never done that in the past four years. You don't drink. You're manufacturing cruelty as a positive <laughs> attribute of your personality. Come on. Right? You're uh, taking your shirt off on stage. This is a definite punk rock yes. And I just would suggest that um that 
if you want a little bit more monster in your life, mm -hmm. I would say take the way that you interact with me and <laughs> like all of the time and sort of matriculate it across all of your interactions. You know, I know you're not wrong. Yeah. Like I don't treat my daughter like a I would never treat her like a monster. You too. Her I have a different journey with. I'm trying to practice saying no. Mm -hmm. Like we were at the grocery store the other day and you know, at the grocery store they put all of the sugared cereals on the bottom row, which is very annoying. Oh, so for the kids? The kids can reach them. You so think she's it's like by accident? I'm sure it's not. No, she's like, Cocoa Puffs. I'm like, No, we're not getting that. And she's like, Fruit loops. I go, No, we're not getting that. And she's like, But you know, whatever all these like fruity pebbles, please. I've always wanted to try fruity pebbles. And then she starts crying <laughs> in the eye. I go, listen, General Mills causes cancer. <laughs> and then she starts crying in the middle of the. She goes, I don't want cancer. Yeah. And she was like, Papa died of cancer. She goes, oh. she was so confused. She goes, she looked at me with these big eyes. She's like, why would they do that? And I go, I don't know, honey. It's one of the big questions of our time. <laughs> <laughs> and then she starts crying. And then I was like, I I'm sorry. I was just trying to get you to shut up. But then it's like, I, and I go, they don't cause cancer, but they do. So now it's like, I'm just saying it's like, like, it was, it was not really a researched <laughs> or informed opinion. It just <laughs> seems generally true. No, it is true. Look General it up. General Mills causes cancer. Yes. We're going to get sued literally for this podcast. Laura, have you heard this? General heard, Mills Laura, cereals. Have you heard this? Gen can you look it up? <laughs> no, General it's like Mills causes cancer. A huge talking point. I mean, she's sure on it's TikTok. A talking point. General Mills cereals. There's like all these Nabisco. Like there's all these companies that have. I just want to go on the record personally <laughs> as a representative of the uh, Endless Honeymoon podcast and also just of myself. Am I right? Uh, that I don't have anything disparaging to say about General Mills, Nabisco, Nestle. I think is one of the most ethical companies of our time. Nestle, uh, what they do. Um, with labor, what they do with water rights around the world is actually admirable and beautiful. Shell Oil, I love you guys. Uh, you're all, to me, you are Bay. Shell is Bay. Nestle is Bay. Hold on. Laura, what's the... What's the verdict? Weed killer. They use a weed killer for their cereals. In Cheerios? Cheerios causes cancer is what we're saying? That, I mean, I've seen that a bunch. We're going to get sued. Straight up. I love Clorox. I love DuPont. I love uh, the Koch brothers. I love um, Blackwater Security. Uh, every, uh, it's all good. I just want to say that. It's Blackwater Security. It's important. All these, all these organizations, the Wagner Group in Russia, you guys are doing great work. Okay, listen. I'm just saying it is really hard to know what to say to your child. I feel like I try to be honest with her and I'm like potentially traumatizing her just by like talking to her. Mm, I feel that trauma from talking to you constantly. That's legit and a legit concern because I am in a deep state of constant trauma, but because I am your roommate. So I definitely feel that. Honey, you're so romantic. I mean, listen, you're my wife and I love you. And I was so proud of you uh, this week. I thought it was so cool and punk rock your little video. I just was like, that's my wife right there. You know, and what a cool. That's why I married you. What a cool, open minded guy I am that my <laughs> wife can go on stage and flop her tits out. And I just go, yes, that artist, that's my artist. But you know what's kind of happening to me? Because when we first met, one of the reasons I've talked about this before that I was like, this is the man for me is because you told me from the very beginning, just so you know, you can always make fun of me on stage. I don't care. And I was like, wow, he's so confident. I thought yeah. that was so cool. But now I make fun of you so hard. I do feel like if you saw my set, I'm, I'm wondering that. where I'll, you will draw the line. I can tell you where I'll draw the line. I know exactly where I will draw the line. Hmm. Um, you, over the years of us, I don't care what you say about me on stage. It doesn't matter. What do you think I say about you on stage? I mean, Nothing. I mean, I talk a lot of shit. I talk a lot of shit. And I bring up my side piece, too. It's funny that none of us, neither of us watch each other's sides. <laughs> It's like a mystery. I'll tell you where I draw the line. I draw the line. You have forgotten over the years of our marriage that I said very specifically, you can say whatever you want about me on stage, on stage. As opposed to what? It, at a party in front of our friends. Oh, yeah. You get really upset about that. Yeah. that. that Sometimes I'm I get a little feeling, confused because I'm like, yeah, oh, well, I can stage, just like. The stage is where you take your shirt off <laughs> and the rest of the world is just the world. Okay. So that's where that's where I draw the line. I don't want to be personally humiliated, but I do if it will uh creatively add put wind beneath your wings, then I am all for it. And Natasha's been on the road a lot lately, killing it, crushing, selling out. And I'm very excited that you're falling back in love with stand up. That makes me feel good. I wouldn't say I'm falling I back would. in love with I would. it. I would. I would. I, I had fun taking my shirt off after Bert. Yep. 
and you're falling back in love with stand up. Didn't you get a standing ovation in Austin? I did, honey. Standing O's, man. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Go see Natasha at a, at a theater near you and, uh, you know, buy my book and all that stuff and come see me live. I'm going to a lot of co- cool places, actually. Where are you going? Going to Tacoma. Going I'm going to Tacoma. To- oh, shit. We should Check go on the road together again. <laughs> what do you think? Let's start touring together again. Okay, you don't want maybe to Maybe in anymore. the summer. Okay. That sounds like a no. Fine. Come see me alone. I'll tell you what. Dude, nobody, nobody crowd works like me. I mean, when it comes to Natasha versus me, uh, no, you are better at crowd work. Natasha's but. a wonderful comedian. She's one of the best in the world. But when it comes to that, to that off the cuff crowd work, there's nobody like me. Can't compare. Um, I will also be at Snowmass Village, which is like between I'm, Vale and Aspen. I'm coming to see you there. Oh no, you're gonna, you're, we're gonna. Oh, I'm gonna both, open for you. Yeah, we're gonna both be That's performing. Right. Now that listen, I don't like opening for people, especially my wife, because it makes me feel emasculated. Like my penis is even smaller than this microphone. It makes me feel like my penis <clears throat> is as small as one of those little Wayne Brady microphones that, or the Tony <laughs> Robbins ones, you know, or even worse, like a lav mic. But when she is going to Snowmass Village, you know, I'm do that. I'm I'm at that show. All right, well, come out to Snowmass. Where else? I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to New York. I'm going to when Madison, going to Sh- Wisconsin. I'm oh, excited about those that. those are good spots. Yeah, they're, they're great spots. I'm a great comedian. I'm a great person. I'm a good guy, good husband. I make love like a champ, thicker than average girth. Life is good for you. Life is good for me. Hey, Tosh. Yeah, Mosh. Are you a good cook? Uh, no, you're not. That's the answer I'm looking for. And I wish that there was a way on the days when I can't cook that I could come home and there would be just a delicious, healthy meal, ready to serve, and you wouldn't have to worry about slaving over them kitchen flames. Would I have to go to the grocery store or do prep work or have cooking fatigue? No. With Factor, it all comes to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Yeah, these are chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals that are delivered right to your door. You can skip the overpriced takeout. You can just get your meal on with almost no work. You know what I like about Factor, by the way? What? They don't just have meals ready for you. They've got all these options, like those add-ons you were talking about. There's smoothies, there's breakfast juices, there's snacks. They even have a special occasion gourmet plus. It's like the perfect solution if you're looking for a fast but upscale option done super easily. I also love giving my kid the smoothies in the morning, the cold-pressed juices. Finally, I have food in my fridge. Head to factormeals.com slash honeymoon50 and you can use the code HONEYMOON50 to get 50% off. That's factormeals.com slash HONEYMOON50. Use code HONEYMOON50 to get 50% off. That is a lot off. I'm going to do it right now. Well, listen, we have someone waiting to Let's talk to us. So we are going to call, or we're not we, going to call her. We got Katie on the line. Katie, Katie spelled K-A-T-I. Can't say I respect that. F- from Florida. Oh, from Florida. I see. They don't know how to spell Katie properly in Florida, so they just had to go Katie. All right, she's been waiting for a few minutes. Let's I, do I it. know we've been on a rant. All right, let's, let's pull her ass in. Let's see what's up. What's up, Katie? Kati? Kati? What do you think it is? Kati? Katie? It's got to be Katie. It's obviously Katie. Yeah. You know what's always a funny trait is when somebody um, does uh, um, a weird new spelling. Kati, how you doing? Hi, Katie. Our hey, daughter Katie. had your um, haircut and. Oh, it, that is so it grew true. Out. Looks Your like daughter that. has this haircut too? Yeah, well, she she wanted it, actually. she I don't know how she got it in her mind, but she said, I want a full shave on the side. And uh, and then we weren't really ready to commit, so we gave her like a square inch of shave. No, she had like a quarter shave, but I think she was a little upset because no one really noticed. And I and then I was like, oh, she's she wants people at school to like be like, whoa, you shaved your head. You look like Katie in Florida. <laughs> Katie, you actually you actually don't look like you live in Florida. You look cool. No, there's cool people in Florida. I'm definitely not from Florida, so okay. I do appreciate that, actually. I think there's cool people in Florida. People in Florida are extreme. They got abs. They're cool. Okay. I They're like Florida. extreme in some ways, yes. I like Florida. No, it's cool to work on your buns and your abs yeah, all yeah, day long. I love buns and abs. Do you not? It is one of my favorite two things. Two of my favorite one things. KT, how can we help you? Um, hi. Well, I have a question that is sort of about sobriety and the program. I am married to a man who has been sober for, it'll be five years next month that he's been sober. And he went through AA and 
worked to all the steps and like did it right. Like we met like a little bit after he had a year of yeah. sobriety and that's, he went through it all like very to the book and he's like very much like a big, I mean, it saved his life. We love the program. Sure. And as he's sort of gone through it, now he's at a place where he like, isn't going to meetings as much isn't super involved in it like he used to be. I mean, he was very much like going a couple times a week, like really involved in trying to find like people to sponsor and that sort of thing. And now it's just not so much a thing. And so I guess my question is, as Moshe, as a sober person who was once in the program and isn't really so involved now, from what I understand, how did that transition like work for you? What did that look like? Because he's not necessarily looking to be like, I'm not in this anymore, but it's not such a big part of what he does anymore and like his sobriety doesn't depend on yeah. his involvement. I, I have a question AA. before Moshe drops all his wisdom on you. What is your <laughs> drinking like? Um so I drank socially when I met him and when we started dating we were like really annoyingly stereotypical in that on like date one we knew that we were each other's forever. And so Aww. like from that day I stopped drinking and it was really easy for me. I've never had a problem with it. Luckily um so I don't drink or do any drugs or do anything. And so we, we have just a very boring sober house. <laughs> so so what is your concern that he might get triggered or that you are you a little nervous that he's kind of taking a step back? Um, the tiniest bit nervous just because I really don't have a ton of experience with sobriety. I have experience with addicts. I have had it in my family and that sort of thing, but I don't have as much experience with people actually like working the program and getting clean. And I'm not worried about him like going back out or doing anything like that or like using or drinking as much as just like I, like what does that like look like now like if there is something that is triggering like what uh what do we do what does he do like what a, and just mostly curious on like what that experience of getting out of the program look like you ready for, for this, you guys ready for, for this you. knowledge drop yep all right, here we go. Buckle up. No, I, I, I think this is a very complicated question because AA, uh, w well, it totally saved my life too. It doesn't, this mm -hmm. particular question of detaching or, uh, or diminishing your relationship with it is as close to a full taboo in AA as you can get. As I say in the book, I say right. you'd be, you would be better received standing up at an AA meeting saying, I am going to do meth in the bathroom at this meeting tonight than to stand up and say, I'm thinking about not going to AA anymore. You'd be more welcomed with the sentiment like I'm literally smoking meth tonight in the bathroom. So... <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So AA does this thing where it doesn't encourage that kind of questioning for good for like good reason, right? They're like, like, don't leave us. I don't think it's actually about control, although it can sometimes seem like that from the outside. But I think their their model is about saving as many people as they can uh, with the simplest methods possible. So their model is the uh, is the preservation model, right? And so this whole like dalliance with with existential questions of like, how much do I truly want this to be a part of my life? It doesn't help save the most amount of people the, the longest. The thing that works the best just in terms of like, stay sober is come into AA, don't leave, go to meetings for the rest of your life, never go anywhere right. else. And that is good advice if all, if you're just looking at like how many people can I save at once, but it becomes difficult if you're an individual who is like, I'm not getting what I need out of this, right? And then there's all these techniques where they go, well, it's not about you getting what you need out of this. It's about you giving back. And I think all that stuff's true. But at a certain point, it's like, I want to live my own life. I'm not going to live according to the rules that, that are mandated to me. So then it becomes about like an individual journey. Like I had to re realize for myself, like I was really um, scared to, it took me years, by the way, to stop going to meetings. And, 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 and a big part of that was I was scared of what would happen. But another big part was I was scared of what other people would think. Uh, if they would think that I yeah. was like sick or fucked up or a dry drunk or having problems or just not, or, or uh, betraying my thing. So one of the first things that I wrestled with was that. And then I had to realize like I didn't get sober for other people. I didn't come to AA in order to impress people in AA. I came to AA to, to save my own life. And I did. And that happened. Oh, I have an idea. Because to me, one of the coolest things about AA, from hearing it explained, and also one of the things that I try to tell Moshe he should do, but he doesn't want to because he's not in AA anymore, is help other people. And like maybe if he is feeling 
you know, maybe you could talk to him about if you are feeling triggered or whatever, like just the ability, cause you know, you could encourage him, I guess, to be out there maybe sponsoring someone else. Are you allowed yeah. to sponsor someone if you're not going to like four meetings a week? It's a great question, Natasha. Here's the issue that I have. The sponsoring is what I think is such a cool thing about it. Here's the issue that I personally right. had with continuing to sponsor people was that as I started to believe less and less in the party line, in the, the dogma of the 12 uh, that's contained in, in AA, there were things I just stopped believing. It's not because I had a problem with them ideologically. I ju- they just didn't feel resonant or true for me. I found it very difficult and hypocritical to be sponsoring another person and saying, oh, this is the system by which we get sober when I didn't even know if I believed in those things anymore. But aren't you just modeling a sober life for them? No, you are not. You are taking them through the 12 steps. and and, and, Yeah. And and that is, the 12 steps to me are like huge mega fonts of wisdom that I used to believe in like the way people believe in religion, religious fundamentals. And they more over the years for me have become... Um, more flexible uh, ways that I live my life, but I don't necessarily have a, a, as ardent a view about them as I once did. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off the point. I don't think that you can necessarily sponsor. I don't think I could, I should say, sponsor people while not being in the program. That, that wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't work for me. Um, so I have a few thoughts. One, there's no question that without AA, a person is more likely, in my mind, there's no question, that without AA or some kind of active participation in recovery-based stuff, maybe that's therapy, maybe that's something else, they, that you are more likely to drink again. I mean, it just is true. It's like, a, that, that mm-hmm. isn't, that's, I don't think that that's even really negotiable. Like, if you make your recovery like the primary thing in your life, then you're more likely to continue to be sober. If you take it down, then it does present the risk that at some abstract point in the future you could drink again um so since when i got to that thing where i was like this is not about other people this is about me i my relationship with my life it's not about um whether or not people think i'm cool for being here or not then i had to say i need to monitor my own progress uh about whether taking aa out of my life uh is detrimental to my mental health and my spiritual state of being um, and so I think for you, if your husband really is deciding to like detach, if that's the decision he's made, and I think it's a personal decision and I don't really have an opinion on whether someone should or shouldn't. I love AA and think that it's a really useful tool for people. But you won't go to a meeting now. Uh, I, I, I would, would I go to a, what do you mean? Like I had know some people who like, why doesn't Moshe come to a meeting? And you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, it's just like asking me why I don't go to church anymore when I decided I don't necessarily believe in in the church anymore. Mm. Why? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like that. I, I If somebody called me and asked me to come with them to an AA meeting because they needed help, I would definitely go. I don't have like a taboo about it. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, I think that, that you being honest with your husband and your husband being honest with you about what you see, if he makes that decision that he doesn't want to do that anymore, that's what's important. Is like if he, if he stops going yeah. to meetings and you notice that he's becoming, uh, you know, agitated or he's becoming resentful or he's just generally has less peace of mind, then you have to have the courage to tell him, like, I don't think this is working for him, for you. Yeah. Right. And he is still really like his where he works. The company that he works for is owned by his sponsor. He is has a desk next to his best friend who he met in rehab and like lived in halfway with and then in sober living after that, like. So he's his community is very much like a sober community built up of people who are like are very like minded when it comes to staying sober and they're very involved in the program. And so that's part of what's hard about him deciding to sort of step away from it is like while he's still surrounded by that community and feels really supported by that community, he doesn't necessarily feel the need to go to meetings so much. But the people who are still in meetings regularly, like don't see it as such a good idea. And so it's it's a lot of pressure from other people where he doesn't necessarily feel that pressure like internally to still be going and we communicate very openly about it and so it it, it's not so much a problem at home as much as just like how does he even do this with it like you said it's like a weird taboo in the program there's not really an exit plan for people from the program it's just sort of you're in here forever first of all you do a lot you're so generous like you know you're you're speaking at 
You're speaking in a passionate and with a passion and fervor that people usually reserve for themselves, <laughs> their own problems. Like I understand you're married to him, but then you also like you're so supportive. You stopped even socially drinking to be a support system for him. You know, you're like you're so concerned about him, but really this is him and this is his choices. Mm -hmm. And I think all you can really do is support him and let him know you're here for him. And you know, it's, 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 it, this is his issue. And, and I'm sh I, yeah. I wouldn't even call it an issue actually. Right. I, I would say this is his path and like, he's got to figure out, I think Natasha's right. He has to figure out for himself how much or how little of AA he wants in his life. There is no rule. No one makes rules. There, the, all the rules are culturally mandated, just uh, figments of people's imaginations. Like he can go to meetings once a month. He can go to meetings once a year. He can go to no meetings. He can go to five meetings a week. He's allowed to do anything that he wants. And Most all, men don't have that big of a problem sticking up for themselves. Well, I, I, I think you don't <laughs> appreciate. That's funny. But I think you don't appreciate the level of... Um, pressure that being sober in a 12-step group can exert mm. on a person to conform to the group's uh, standards. And I'm not an anti... I really hope it doesn't sound like I'm an anti a guy. I'm really not. I'm like every day yeah. super grateful to it. And in fact, I, I, I use the principles that I learned in AA in my life constantly, constantly. It's, it, it is like truly my sort of spiritual and ethical framework that I, much more than Judaism, I use AA stuff to like actually live mm. my life by. But I also recognize that there are sort of blind spots in the program. And the, one of the biggest blind spots is what does a person do who decides they don't want to go anymore or want to go much less? And how does that person function? That, since there's no one to talk to, it's you can't really go to a meeting and say, I mean, you can do this. You can go to a meeting and say, I don't want to go here anymore. But the advice you will be given pretty much invariably uh, is we don't oh, recommend that. Don't do that. That's your that's your diseased mind right. telling you to, to leave. Don't do that. So if a person makes a real decision that they want to do it, what what are they supposed to do? And I think like that it's a scary journey. And in fact, I would say it's safer. It's a safer bet for your husband to just keep going to, to meetings. It is. It's a it's a smarter and safer bet. But if it's a spiritual journey that he has to take, then I do think you're in. I don't agree with Natasha. I think you're in it. This is your is your issue to deal with too, because you are his partner and you live with him. And if if there are negative consequences as a result of him going, you are going to bear the brunt of those consequences. And so I think like having an open and honest dialogue about really where he's at, like up to and including literally having a six month check in and yeah. saying like, how's this been going? It's been six months since you've yeah. been in a meeting. How are you doing? Do you feel closer to a drink? Maybe getting a therapist. Here's what I, I know I'm talking a lot, but it's an issue I'm passionate about. The one that I write about extensively in the new book. So I think I would recommend him getting the new book, Subculture Vulture, available. Already pre-ordered. Hell yeah. But I think I think that um, that one thing that is is smart in, in this is to, like a person told me when I was like really struggling with this, because it took me two years to... To decide to, to drop out, to decide to stop going. From the moment I was having kind of an existential problem to the moment I saw it, decided to give myself permission to not go to meetings anymore, it was at least two years. And somebody told me like, when you leave, and this kind of goes to what you're talking about, Natasha. When you leave AA, there isn't nothing takes its place. No, no, no sudden like other mission fills in the gap. It's just an empty space in your life that used to contain meetings and helping other alcoholics and, sp and prayer and meditation and all this stuff. Why can't you still do prayer and meditation? That's the point that I'm getting at. Oh. Is that when you take AA out, all of a sudden there's this spot, this empty space that used to be filled with all the things you did in AA and you can either fill it with Prayer and med yeah, maybe it's some kind of meditation program or something you guys could do together right. that would be a spiritual yeah. thing. Yeah, you can either fill it with things like a spiritual program and maybe volunteering at a at a homeless shelter or or, or a, a, a treatment center or uh you know or whatever it is. He, you can fill it with all this stuff, or you cannot fill it with all that stuff, and then it becomes a blank spot in your life that can just be filled with PlayStation or resentment or just being lazy. Like <laughs> you have to be. Yeah. At least you don't have to, but. I think it's a good idea to proactively take the space that is removed from your life when you decide to go to AA less or altogether and fill it with something else that's positive and beneficial and healthy. 
uh, that ensures long-term success much more than just saying I'm going to wing it. Does that help at all? Yeah, definitely. And and really, that was my question was just like your thoughts on it generally and, and sort of what that looked like, because it's a weird transition. To, he, he's sort of in the process of that. He's definitely been going less and it's, it's already sort of happening. And so I think the six month check in idea is a great idea just to sort of like touch base and see where we're at. And is it working for you? And if not, then maybe reassess and and like I said, he's still involved with a lot of people who are program people and all that. He's not like without community if he doesn't go. Right. And so there's still so much support for him. Right. And, you, and you have to really like trust that he's on his own journey. You know, like I love this yeah. kind of chanting. I do like, but then I would go to the meetings and I'm like, I, I can't do this. This is not for me. I have to do this at home. <laughs> the meditation meeting. Yes. Like right. I just can't. And like. You know, so I do my own practice and I'm probably missing out a little bit by not going there. But it's just it's not something I'm willing to do. Yeah. And also there's no rules like there are no rules here. This is an this your husband is on his own journey and he gets to decide yeah. like he doesn't. It's not a binary like you don't either go to meetings all the time or you no longer go to meetings. You can also decide like, oh, I'm going to make this new system where I now go to a meeting every three months and just check. He can do that. And because you have to think like their rules for, are for everybody. Right. Exactly. You know, like like when people say this, people are going to hate me for saying this, but when they like do not drink when you're pregnant, you know, Okay, this sounds no, crazy. No, no, I, I hear like, what you're saying. Doctors are like, you actually, it has been proven you can have a glass of wine in your third trimester once a week if you wanted to. Like, that would not hurt you at all. But if they told everybody that, right. people would be like drinking vodka their whole pregnancy. So it's like, and like, same with my chanting meeting. Like, whenever something's powerful, people try to control it. Right. And so with AA, it's like they just have to have these like, large grand grandiose statements that are for the public well, you know and easier. obvious it's easier and then obviously people can kind of decide in between that what they want and yes they're going to be met with you know people be, his his office mate being like hey man i really missed you at the meeting we're worried about you you know and he's just going to have to right. deal with that right there th you're exactly yeah. right natasha the whole method in Thank aa you. is uh, to save the most people in in the quickest amount of time and so for for them the message is if you go if you leave you will drink and if you drink you will die That's no well uh, hold on but for his friends it's like if you leave I might fuck up. Yeah, well, there's so, that too. So they're like, we need you because then what about yeah. me? You know, well, so it's, the, I might, he, the, his friend might not be as strong as him. No, there is an existential thing that happens when somebody that's in a, in a, uh, an essential um, position in a social group in the, in AA goes out and it's okay. It creates this real mind fuck, right? So like I said, like in the book, I say like, yeah, the, the, to, if you leave, you will drink. If you drink, you will die. That's a super simple, extremely reductive statement that, is just really useful because it just says, don't go anywhere, stay here, stay sober. That's simple. It's not real. There's no real message in if you leave again, you might drink, but you might not drink, but you might get miserable. You might need to come back, but it might just be misery, but not drinking, but it might actually lead to a relapse. But if you do relapse, you might actually be okay because alcoholism sometimes is permanent, but sometimes it's actually just a manifestation of psychological deficiencies that you worked out in the 12 steps. Anyway, when you do drink, you might have terrible consequences, but it's actually possible that you won't have any consequences at all. But it's also sort of possible that you'll have some consequences that don't resemble the original consequences that brought you to AA, but they're their own consequences. You have to try... That's a message where you start to like, nobody knows what to do. So I think you're right. Yeah. Like chaos is difficult to deal with. The world is filled with chaos. And, uh, and, and so it, they have binary rules, but we don't live in a binary world. And so your husband um, should, should just, and you go into this with your eyes open and not, don't leap, go yeah. slow. That's my advice. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. All right. Well, good luck, Katie. <laughs> thank you so much guys it was really great to meet you both nice to meet you Me i hope too. you enjoy the book and check in with us about your husband's uh, whole journey we're, we're curious yeah we'll do Sweet. thanks so much guys nice Bye. talking to you that was helpful i think well that's something that i'm intimately familiar with i mean i and i get anxiety when i talk about that topic you know even though i like I feel like I have a lot of experience with it and a lot of expertise i feel scared because i know that somebody there are people out there that if they decide to stop going to meetings, they will drink again. And if they drink again, they will die. I mean, that is just true. Really? It is true. They die? Uh, I've had many people. In fact, I had a person that I love very dearly very recently who stopped drink, who stopped going to meetings, started drinking, and it, 
and is no longer with us, you know? And so, uh, so it has real world consequences, but you know, there was a guy in AA, this guy, Lord, that used to say, um, I really loved this. He said it wasn't, I, there was a point in my sobriety where I had to stop backing away from a bottle and turn around and start walking toward God. Right. And I thought that was a powerful, powerful imagery. And like, for me, it was like, I didn't want to let fear determine how I was living my life. Like that was sort of what was left in AA because I wasn't getting fed from it spiritual anymore. So I wasn't getting the good part of AA, which is really powerful medicine. And there is a good part. I wasn't getting that because of all the anxiety and stuff that, uh, that I was having around being in the program for a, a bunch of different reasons. So the only thing that was keeping me there was fear and, and the terror of what might happen if I stopped. Mm. And then I had this other realization, which is I don't want to let fear be a determining factor in the way I live my life in, on any level. And so in, I, tur- I stopped uh, you know, backing away from the specter of a bottle and turned around and started walking toward what I wanted my life to look me. like. Toward you. Yeah, but for real. All right, well, can we like, I don't know, Lighten listen it up? to some secrets or something? That's a great idea. Hey, Tosh. Yeah, Mosh. You know what I don't like? What's that? Wasting hella money on something I don't use. Ugh, me too. I'm with you, you bro. You know what I do like, bro? What? Rocket money, because it stops that cycle and it's freaking tracks. I've had like five people tell me to get on rocket money this past month, and I'm already doing it. Wait. I saved $80 last month. I keep, I was subscribed to the Criterion collection for two years and i don't even know the password and you hadn't watched one because Not, really i watched one that's why i subscribe you're the fan of michael bay you are the fan of michael bay <laughs> listen if you are paying for unwanted subscriptions and you want it to stop but you don't even know where to begin go to rocket money it's an personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. There's over 5 million users that they've helped and they save their members an average of $720 a year. They've got $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Salads are $30, so stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash honeymoon. That's rocketmoney.com slash honeymoon. Rocketmoney.com slash honeymoon. Hey guys, I've got two secrets for the same people. First, my ex-wife was cheating on me with my best friend. So what did I do when we went on a trip, me and him, to a race together? I took his brand new toothbrush after I took a shit and I ran his toothbrush (gasps) around the toilet, pushing my piece of shit all around the toilet and then put it back up for him to brush his teeth the next morning. Uh, Wait, why did he do this? Shit breath. The only person that knows that besides me, my brother. (laughs) What did I do to my ex-wife when I got back? I There's took more. all of her date underwear and I jacked off in the <laughs> crotch of them, folded them up, and put those bitches back in the drawer so that when they went out, he could eat my shit off her pussy. <laughs> Fuck him. That's my secret. Later. I mean, the country accent is kind of selling it. Wait, that was Australian, right? Oh, that was Southern? The whole time I thought this guy was Australian. That sounded like Texas. Dude, this is... Like, this is a proper secret right here. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, you know how I'm always like kind of wagging my finger on this podcast about people taking revenge? Mm-hmm. This is good ass revenge right here. What did the guy do to make them? He cheated on his wife. He no, fucked his the, wife. With the, that's what the toothbrush his, thing? His best friend <gasps> fucked okay, his wife. All right. And then he took his toothbrush. I swear to God, I thought he was Australian. And I was going to say this is the most Australian revenge ever. But honestly, the difference between this, the American South and Australia it, I, it, it might as well be the same place. And I just loved it. I j- he jacked off on the panties. I don't know what he was talking about at the end where he's like, he's he like, so he, he, I think he was calling his cum his shit. Like it's but that's my so shit. confusing because earlier his shit was his shit. It's all his shit. Yeah. His general shit. Hold on one second. Captain's over here mewling because he wants to get in on this. Sh- oh, hold on. Let me bring Captain into the conversation. Actually, hold on just a second. In. Captain needs to because uh, if there's one person in this family unit, to be honest, if there's one 
if there's one family member here that loves eating shit and understands eating that eating shit it's got to be captain right i mean he's a little bit of a shit eater himself all yeah. dogs are hey you got to be quiet though we're podcasting right now hey listen to me we're podcasting right now do you get it hey don't I'm, interrupt i'm proud that i never talk to the dog like they're a human i always do you what do you go oh, you bougie? no i'm like get out of here dog oh you mean as you're like i'm talking to you do you not understand what i'm saying like dogs don't understand that i mean my dog does my my dog is my captain and the, the he's a circus dog. Did I tell you by the way he's a certified circus dog? <laughs> yeah, we can bring him on planes now. Yeah, you just have to put a tutu around his neck <laughs> instead of the red service vest. Uh, you know, a red nose, <laughs> a red nose and a tutu, and people go, "Oh no, no, he's allowed. He's actually allowed on the flight." Um, oh, that's a good secret. I loved it. Thank you for sharing it with us. And uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. But honestly, it makes me like I know that this isn't exactly what he said, but it makes me never want to go to a restaurant. That definitely isn't what he said. It has nothing I know, to but do with anyone could do anything. Uh-huh. I mean, women have long ass nails that definitely get shit put in shit cake, caked shit in their nails. And men are just gross in general, sneezing. You I know mean, what's interesting is uh, th- it was I just remembered this as he was saying it. I recently took all your panties and jerked off in them bitches and, and folded them bitches up and put them bitches <laughs> back in the drawer. I just did that. It's so eerie that this guy called in this week. All right. Do we have another secret to yeah. cleanse my palate? <laughs> I got something you could cleanse your palate with. It's this toothbrush right here. <laughs> Hi, Natasha. Hi, Moshe. Um, my secret is that I recently got out of a relationship where I found out afterwards that the guy had cheated on me. Uh, I've been insecure about the idea of that happening throughout our relationship. And one of the girls who I suspected he wanted to <gasps> screw while we were together he definitely tried to as soon as we broke up or during the relationship because he followed her on Instagram right away. Um, it was the receptionist of where he worked. Ugh. She's like, right, his type and like all this. So I called his workplace one day and I said, hi, I'm calling from blank county uh, supervision and probation. We're just doing top of year place of work checks. Can you <laughs> confirm that blank name uh, still works with you guys? And it works because he's actually on probation. So when she Googles him, she'll actually find out that he has a criminal record. Um, It felt really good, to be honest. Bye. Okay. So how did she think of this? Well, you know, she was calling her the off the office he works at, saying that he's been in jail. That uh, yeah, at some point. Implying yeah. That is that's a good one. Someone should steal that. Captain, come here. Come, Captain, come. Oh my God, he just busted a nut. Um, sit down. Captain, don't be annoying. Captain, don't be annoying. Unfortunately, our dog is so well trained that when I say Captain, come, he just, he busts. Moshe. That's funny. That's classic comedy. That's a bust joke. I think that's kind of fucked. First of all, it's kind you of You think fu- it's fucked up? Yeah. Does this sound sexist? Because I liked what the guy did and I don't like what the woman did. You like that the guy cheated on his girlfriend? What? I like that he pushed the shit log around with the guy that cheated. The truth is the person that cheats, if it's your best friend, that's bad. But honestly, like, why is it bad that a guy started following someone and seeing someone on, uh, soon after they broke up? That's when you're supposed to start seeing people. Wait, hold on. I thought she said he cheated on her. He, she, she said something like that. And then she said, the guy that the woman I always suspected he wanted to screw, he started following oh. right after we broke up and maybe before. She doesn't even have evidence that, they, that he cheated. What is he supposed to do? Not see other people now that they're broken up? No, I hear you, but you know, it stings and yeah, it, it sucks. Stings, and like, you know, that's one of the reasons also why I married you. What? Because I knew you would never cheat on me. How you know? I can just tell. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I'm just trying to get permission to open it up so I don't have to. Okay. Yeah. After that pandemic, honey, I'll do anything. That's amazing. Although I don't believe it. But here <laughs> is what... Um, uh, what I, I think is fucked up is using somebody's criminal record against them. That feels like too far. Pushing a log of shit around. That's good fun. That's like mm, family friendly. I know, but I like, I like the, the mental, I mean, you know, she'll eventually find that it's not true. It is true. The motherfuckers on probation. It's true. Oh, he really was on probation. Yes. Oh, well, then do you listen to these secrets? <laughs> I was. T- <laughs> All right, let's play another one. Listen, you know, I'm a mother. I have I actually read I'm a, a book. I'm a father. I just read a book. Well, I read a chapter of a book that was saying that women's brains, like if you give birth, it's proven 
that your brain cells get rearranged and a lot of like the memory and short term memory is like just becomes like mass. It's like it, it has to move around to make room for other stuff. That's why you get so stupid after you have a baby. I don't think you're stupid, honey. I think you're sharp. I do. Attack. No, honey, never, never. You know who is a bit of a dum dum though? Captain. All right. Let no one cares about us, our dog. People love Captain. People said on the IG more Captain related content, please. I mean, he is like I've never had a dog that loves me so much. No, like he's you a come lover. over and he's like, Ooh, and he'll like move his head so that you can pet him in a certain way. And then he just kind of like groans and stays there. It's yeah. kind of pathetic. It, he's a pathetic guy. And I and I love that about him. Hey, Tosh. Yeah, Mosh. This was the year that I got serious about my skin. I know. You're kind of like more into it than I am now. Well, you've got great skin and I want to keep my great skin. And for that, I use one skin. They've got this scientifically proven peptide called OS1. You know, Moshe, you have been using this now for, I think, two weeks religiously. And your skin does look good. You got I, that glow. I use it religiously in that I worship it because their products are powered by this scientifically proven peptide called OS1 that targets fine lines and wrinkles where they start, which is your cells. Now, this isn't like another skincare routine. This is like science, man. And I am putting it on. I, I mean, listen, do I, am I, do I look a million years younger? I feel like I have a glow about me. Tosh, I spend a lot of time in the sun because I surf and I worry about becoming one of these old leathery surfer guys who's lived big but looks bad. That's why I'm glad there's like science backing this stuff up. OS1, do I understand the formula? No, I do not. But they have scientists that do. And I'm so excited about this new skincare regimen. They're trying to get to the root causes of aging. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. So get started today with 15% off using the code HONEYMOON at oneskin.co. That's 15% off with oneskin.co with code HONEYMOON. Like I said, this was the year I got serious about my skin because I'm not getting younger, but I want to look younger, and I will with one skin. After your purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about us. Please support our show. Tell them we sent you New Year Healthier Skin. Get one skin. All right, we're going to call Ryan in Virginia for a brand new call. This better be a good one. This one will be good. I can feel it. I feel Ryan coming through. Ryan. Hello. Hi. This How is not you? what we're ex- we were expecting. Uh, you're uh, yeah. We weren't oh, expecting yeah. <laughs> a hot fashion plate. That's so true. Ryan, we thought we were you know some like Aussie, Auss- uh, yeah, Aussie boy. <laughs> Let me ask you, what kind of music do you DJ? <laughs> <laughs> you look cool. You look awesome. How can we help? Are you coming um, to see me on uh, at Sixth and I in Washington D.C. on February sixth? That's a really important question. Ooh, wait, when? February? I might. Yeah, you should. You definitely should. All right. How can we help? And also, Ryan, um, we have an open relationship now. So, oh, yeah, you know, have, true. have fun. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> Ryan might not be um, interested. So that let's, I want to put that out there that really this is up to you. I'm okay. honored. I'm honored. Yeah. Uh, big fan of you both. Um, okay. So my, my question, to call it a relationship question, I think is a bit of a stretch. But so this past year, I found out that I'm actually Jewish. Uh, my cool brother's time in- to be Jewish. Wait, what's, just- what's I, up? I know. <laughs> Wait, that is a funny year to find out you're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> October 8th, uh, the DNA results came back. <laughs> yes. Wait, no. <laughs> yes. Um, so my brother's in grad school and he did like a lot of genealogy kind of digging and found out that like our great grandmother was Jewish. Um, Wait, so you're so like one sixteenth was- Jewish? Yeah. And we were like, my brother was very excited. Like I'm very like, as we, you know, white people that have, we were raised like Southern Baptist growing up. Um, and so when we asked my dad about it, are you trying to fuck my husband for real? Yeah, this is a great question. (laughs) I'll tell you this. She's like, um, I'm super hot. I'm a DJ. I have sleeve tattoos. I am going to be in your husband's city and I'm Jewish. (laughs) I will say this episode does seem really geared toward me and specifically my book. Like the first question was about AA. The second one is about Judaism. God, I just feel like everybody should get the book. Okay, oh, so right, you. you found out you're Jewish. You're you're matrilineally Jewish. Yes. Oh wow, so full Jew. One sixteenth Jew blood. One hundred percent Jew. 
Okay. How about that? We asked my we asked my dad about it. Like, did you know this? And he was like, Oh yeah, I always knew. So I don't know why he didn't like ever tell us growing up. Well, it's a shameful um, secret. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, my husband, uh, he also grew up Christian, um, but we no longer subscribe to like that theology. Uh, we consider ourselves agnostic now. Uh, Natasha, I read your book and I really resonated with just some of the things you said about Judaism. Um, Wait, are you trying to fuck my <laughs> wife right now? Or like, what's going on? I love you, mom. Okay, great. <laughs> like, Just you know, like, like how they have Shabbat and stuff. Yeah, like community and mm. family time without phones and things like that. I mean, uh, that's not that Jewish. That's like Shabbat. That's, that's, yeah. Shabbat's <laughs> Jewish? What do you mean? Well, yeah, I guess I guess it is Jewish. I mean, I don't think they have in the Torah to not use your cell phone. They definitely do. Really? That's how you know Judaism's true. It says don't use your cell phone on Shabbat. No, but they do. They say you've refrained from all work. And over the years, the interpretation of work has come to include right. electronic gadgets. But okay. go ahead. So this past year, I had a baby. Um, Congratulations. And I'd like her, thank you, to grow up with some sort of tradition. So my question is, like, how do I respectfully kind of open this box and incorporate some of the culture and values and traditions without, like, a majority of the religious access? Um, well, I'll just say right now, like it's all or nothing. You're either yeah. in, you're either in or you're out. You're a hundred percent committed. No. You either buy a wig. Listen, <laughs> you either buy a wig or you fucking yeah, hit the road, dude. No, honestly, like this is such a large question for the world that I don't understand. Maybe I have like some naivete, but I just don't understand why we aren't all thinking of new ways to like have new religious our own types of religions that work for us in our lives. Like, why is it like, oh, I have to be Jewish. I have to be Buddhist. I have to be Catholic. Like, I, you know, and my daughter was at Waldorf school and that's like completely nature based. And like, I just loved Not all of completely nature based. It's got, it's got strong elements of like sort of proto Christianity. But it was, it. it's still pro it does proto mean before. Yeah. It's sort of suit like, pseudo christian like the the mickle moss feast and this is why people ask questions like this natasha in my opinion is because people don't want to have an abstract idea of spiritual identity they want to connect to an ancient tradition and then make it their own i think yes but i also think people just want to connect and sometimes like yeah. why why don't we all have our own unique religions that work for us and because our family like i love to chant i love to do shabbat i don't the- like to do passover or not passover what's the one where you starve yourself yom kippur i don't like to do that but natasha <laughs> both of the things that you just mentioned are borrowing from ancient traditions and synthesizing them into a, your modern life neither thing that you that's mentioned, what i think we should be doing neither thing that you mentioned is self-starter something that you made up in the abstract they're both you chant you do ch- hindu chants from a six thousand year old religion and you do a, a shabbat uh, service from a six thousand year old religion it's and like, i like to celebrate christmas like my catholic uh, but that, but brethren that's, but that's ryan's question but i'm saying why can't that be acceptable like why you said it isn't well most people are like what are you I just don't. Are you Jewish? I think. Are you c- Christian? I don't know. I just think people are like I think that I legalistic. Just, like most of the Jewish people I know, they're like, you know, it's just more. I don't, I don't know. What? Tell me. You're more articulate than I am. I, I I'm just, not more articulate I don't than understand you are. I why everyone. I just don't understand why everyone's not trying to find their own traditions from anything that speaks to them and but, keep doing it and not be afraid. I think you have a bigotry. Towards what? Because she, Ryan's like, how can I find my own tradition and not be afraid? And you're like, here's the problem with religion. People want to, that's what she's saying she wants to do. Ryan, who, who are you relating to more, me or Moshe right now? Oh, great question. <laughs> no, really, please solve this. Um, I don't know. Like we were just like me and my brother and like my husband, we were just so excited to like, I don't know, find out that we had some sort of culture, you know, in our blood rather than just boring like white people i guess like Listen, <laughs> i don't know what do you really want to do do you want to start celebrating shabbat I'm, i guess i yeah i guess i want to be able to yeah celebrate shabbat and aspects like that without um getting circumcised a real jew yeah yeah you don't <laughs> like, need to, i this is simple this is a i, I mean i'm surprised you had such a reaction people to it, being Natasha. like that is not okay like that is not right like like if we start if, if Moshe and i started doing kwanzaa people would be like uh that's a little fucked up 
I, yeah, it's like you weren't raised in this. Like it's not appropriate. Like, but there is something about Kwanzaa I think is so cool that I want to steal, which is we just learned about it from like a kids program. I don't know if this is true, but this is what they said that presents at Kwanzaa, which is their Christmas replacement, are either books or things you make. Right. That's and how I was they... like, that's so beautiful. Like, what if our what if that's what we had as our tradition, you know, for Christmas or whatever we're celebrating? I love it. I mean, Ryan, this this question is super simple to answer. Uh, and it, in every city in America, there is a temple that is exactly what you're looking for. It's really? Certainly in Washington, D.C. In fact, I would go ahead and venture a guess that the synagogue where I am presenting subculture vulture, uh, an evening in six scenes, uh, sixth and I in Washington, DC is probably the exact synagogue you're looking for. To be honest, the thing is Judaism. And I think Christianity has this too. Uh, but Judaism strongly has this in every big city in America. There is a, a super progressive, take what you want, leave the yeah. rest, um, uh, not ardent. Uh, the, what is that sect called again? Well, there's a, the, reform is the big one. Uh, but reform is the most lax. The, they, are the, they are the most chill. But I, I would say that sometimes people, have, sometimes people can have an issue with reform uh, temples because it, it's a 200-year-old uh, denomination. And so people feel like, yeah, it's chill and they don't make me do anything, but it can feel a little, uh, I don't know, like there's where's the magic kind of a thing. Not to say that I'm sure that there are reformed temples out there that are very magical, but there's all these other like non-denominational versions of it. Um, here in LA, there's a uh, we I, I go to a, a place called Nefesh where members there, and there's a place called Ikar. There's the, there are these like post-denominational things where you'll see a bunch of people that look like you, and they'll have tattoos and they'll be cool, but they're also like seeking some kind of like tradition and magic, and. It's kind of similar to the first call. You just go and you do whatever you want. Nobody's in charge. There's nobody in charge. No but, one. Yeah, there's no one. You're gonna, in charge. I'm going to venture to guess that what is appealing to you about Judaism is not exactly going to temple. Yeah. Um, because I will say, like, what is that thing? What was it called that your brother was a part of where they put the phones in the bags? It was called like um, reboot. There's a there's a there's a thing called reboot, and that's one of their big things. Is uh, there's also, uh, so let me say first what I did. There's a book, I think it's called, is it called Sabbath? By Martin Buber? Is that what it is? It's yeah. a, not a big book. It's yeah. called Sabbath. And they describe Shabbat as, which I thought I think was it's Martin Buber. really beautiful. It they describe it as spirituality in time. So it's basically this 24 hour period where you, it, it starts at sundown Friday and you can light candles, light a candle, light whatever you want. Uh, you break the bread, you have the wine, and then for those 24 hours, you are going to make your own rules up. You are going to maybe do what you don't normally do. You are going to put your phones in these bags. Maybe just you will do it and your husband won't, but your daughter will see that. And maybe you just do it until noon on Saturday. You know, maybe that's too much for you to do 24 hours. You have to kind of arrange your life in a certain way. You know, I was never the person who's going to be like, okay, well, I can't actually sign something because that's considered work. But, yeah. you know, it's all about the phone. Like, why aren't there new religions about our phones? But there's never, but I, mean, I don't. The phones are going to kill us. The, the phones, phones are going to kill us. The phones you are sound, like. You sound, I agree. They're fo the phones are like this, like. And the phones a, are going to kill us. That's what you'll find. Addiction that we're like, ca oh we are careening God. out of control Christ. with the phones. Why does, why would you disagree with that? I would disagree <laughs> with the level of the tenor. I wouldn't. Well, I would actually you, amp you it up. You wouldn't disagree with yourself? Oh, that's such, what a <laughs> I shock. I actually disagree with that I'm not screaming. Well, it's just Tosh. From there, the rooftops. There's more to tradition and spirituality than not liking phones. No, but if you put your but phone away, so much can happen in 24 hours. Right. You can make it your religion. Yeah, that's a crazy religion. That your, your <laughs> I don't think it is. Your religion is no phones. That For means, 24 to hours. Me, to me, now we're really getting into it. If your religion is no phone, then your God is is the is the scary demon of the phone. You worship the phone. It's in, a reality. In, it's your it's reality. It's a part of life. It's your life. Everyone is worshiping their phones. It is like attached to their arm. I also yeah. want to say, I, I don't and know. and we're addicted to our phone, our finger moving. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why. Scrolling is the new smoking. She called oh, yeah. in to say, how can I gain some fun <laughs> uh, connection to this tradition I just discovered? And 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 you're saying drop everything, but not using your phone on Friday. I think Friday to Saturday. To your point, Natasha, why can't we borrow from all traditions? Mm -hmm. If there's actually something I believe, 
it's that if there is any truth in religion at all, it's all the same. All the yeah. truth is the They're same. They're all windows looking onto the same thing. So you could find all these beautiful things in Christianity. You can find all these beautiful things in Islam and Hinduism and in, in every faith tradition. There are things that I would I find objectionable and there are things that I find beautiful and aspirational. And so you've discovered that you've got this sort of like, you know, DNA heritage connection to Judaism and you want to like discover if there's anything in it that feels meaningful to you. This whole idea of like fighting against the things that don't feel meaningful to you before you even enter the space is like, it's sort of pointless. It's like, go to it, take what you want, leave the rest. The same is true for church. The same is true for this whole idea in church or in Judaism. Like if you don't follow these rules, you're going to be punished or go somewhere, uh, go somewhere like hell. It's like, if you don't believe in that, then you shouldn't let that sentiment bother you since it's literally just something someone made up and decided was true go find a temple that's that's uh, non non-denominational or reform go into the space you don't know that she doesn't like temples she's never been who no one she's knows an, she's like who cares like everybody's different she might she's not you don't like temple i think that's a totally legit thing if you don't like it well because i grew up catholic and i think another aspect of her since you, you said southern baptist is your background catholic yeah. was my background it's embarrassing like I wanted to be a part of something else. That's like one of the main pulls for me for converting. Cause I was like this, I am not Catholic in any way. Like this does not yeah. speak to me. And so much in Judaism I thought was really beautiful. And it's, you know, this like very old religion and everyone's like, you know, talking about it in a way, it, it, you know, the conversion part, it was like, you could ask questions and Catholicism was like, no, you listen to what we say. And then they would just tell you stupid shit that you knew wasn't true. So I was like, I'm not going to be in this religion. But there's parts of Catholic of, of Catholicism. Yeah, the churches are pretty. Well, there's things in Catholicism and Christianity that I think are aspirational and that I, and I would like to in, in turn the other cheek is good. Yeah. Liberation theology is really interesting. I don't know what like that is. The, the kind of love, love thy neighborness of Christianity that, mm. that you, used to uh, yeah. exist in this country a little bit more like that. I, yes. All that stuff is aspirational and beautiful. And in Islam too, there's an austerity to Islam. Sufism has this like meditative practice that I think is really beautiful. There's really beautiful, uh, you know, Hinduism has these like, you know, really intense sort Sort of almost nearly psychedelic uh, versions of reality and time and every single religion has uh I essential um beauty to it and has spiritual truth if there is such a thing and every single religion has parts that are really ugly and i don't let the parts that are ugly bother me because i don't believe in them they don't they're not they don't apply to me Ryan, do you feel like you would feel weird doing sh like do you feel like you have to convert in order to she's do a Jewish. shabbat she's already in so she doesn't have to convert it, it was your great grandma on your mother's side, right? Uh, on my dad's side. On your dad's side. Well, yeah, you know, go to a reform temple and you're in. <laughs> you're in. In fact, I think a reform temple would be perfect for you. Just go check it out. But also, the whole mother father thing is stupid. Like, Everything, why? Like I said, every why if your mother did it, every, but if your dad, it's do so you want me to dumb. tell you why? Not really. You don't want to know <laughs> why. You just want to call it dumb. <laughs> okay, cool. You have a cool. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, why? The reason why in the times of the Romans, mm -hmm. they would. Do you really want to know? Yeah. Because it's not a, like a fun story. How long is it going to take? They would rape <laughs> Jewish women. The, the soldiers would come in um. and they would and they would force themselves on Jewish women. And then all of a sudden this question was posed, are these children uh. are these children Roman or are these children Jewish? Can we keep them in our community? And so the rabbis made this thing that said, they didn't even think about the complications that would arise later in life. They made this thing that said, every child born to a Jewish mother is a Jew, is a part of our community fully. And they were welcomed fully into the community. And that is where you get matrilineal descent from. Now we're 2,000 years later and things have gotten much more complicated. And you go like, Ryan's like, well, I want to be Jewish, but my, my, the descent line is for my dad. Why are, why are there barriers to me being involved? Well, that wasn't even something they were thinking about. They couldn't even foresee a future where uh, uh, there'd be five generations of Southern Baptist. Like they just didn't see that future. But, but the that, Romans aren't raping anymore. So why do they still say that? Because that is what is called tradition. It starts a long time ago. I mean, it's just, it just is what it is. Religion, watch Fiddler on the Roof. Watch Fiddler on the Roof. Find a reform, yeah, find a reform temple in Washington, D.C. We, we're sorry that our own um, uh, mar marital uh, disagreements about... Um, <laughs> ancientness <laughs> and modernity have come into this call. I mean, Moshe's like a, a scholar on religion. I'm not trying to like, are, I'm just saying like, I don't, yeah, that's I, I just, that's why, sorry. I thought it was a good question. It is. To ask you guys. Um, yeah. So basically just like 
the phrase like take the fish leave the bones kind of oh i like that it mm. sounds very christian it sounds very southern baptist to be <laughs> honest you know I, there is another thing too which is natasha is 100 percent correct you could go to a temple and go oh not for me i just this isn't i'm not connecting to this on any level and then you can go home and you can say but you know that thing natasha wrote about in her book not using my phone for 24 hours. That was cool. Like, there's no rules. You can do whatever you the fuck you want. you said that was stupid. I did not say that was stupid. I mean, that's. I just think it's clearly the religion of the day. I'm going to start it. Well, I here's what I said. Taking your phone away from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Here's what I took issue with. If your whole relationship with tradition or spirituality or personal development is about being afraid of a telephone, I think that that's an insufficient form of spirituality. I'm not afraid. I just personally think you deep said down, phones are you going to kill us. Those you are, don't want to get rid of your phone for 24 hours. You a week. said our phones are going to kill us. They are. You are afraid of phones. Yeah, of course I am. You just said you weren't. I am afraid of phones. Okay. But you said that they're my God. What, what do you say? I think that if you're, you're saying don't, Leave everything about about Judaism aside, but just keep the part where you don't use your phone. That to me is an insufficient relationship with. I do have a caveat. Yes. If the phone becomes like I don't know something else, then I'm afraid of that. Like you know, it'll be like, isn't Elon Musk making like a helmet you put on your head or something? <laughs> that's like a. Actually, the Apple the Apple one is the one you should be scared of. Apparently, yeah, that it one's might not be crazy. a phone. Like I don't want to sound like in ten years if you're listening to this. I mean, like whatever the phone becomes. Can you imagine in ten years if people are listening to this episode <laughs> because this podcast yeah. has gotten so perennially famous that people are like let's go back i can imagine it i think so too ryan i'm sorry that our um philosophical disagreements in our marriage got into this call but i think like you could do whatever you want but but why not just make a move like why don't you start like go to a temple like he said or maybe just go see moshe speak and then check out the temple the one thing cool about judaism one of the things that's cool about it is there isn't like a recruiting element that they have in christianity people aren't going to be like oh you want to come to the you want to be jewish we need you to we need you in our fold you know like they're not passing out bibles at foot locker like the christians so you yeah. know it's like you it's, it's like a like safe yeah. space so do that try one of the 20 and, and then you can at least observe their their um uh the wine the bread the candles so you can kind of like do your own version of it like you know moshe will will um bless our child every shabbat and do like what it says in his book yeah that's the cool. shabbat book but what i do i do my i don't i, I don't speak hebrew and i don't really re, i don't connect with it as much so i do my own nature blessing for her. Sometimes I'll be like, I hope you are as beautiful as the flowers that were on our trip in Aspen or whatever it is. Like I'll just, whatever comes off the top of my head and it's still a blessing. No, it's not. God, it actually makes God so furious. I know I've <laughs> talked to him about it. He hates Sacrilegious. it. Sacrilegious. No, but actually what it is, Natasha, is exactly, it's the kernel of Ryan's question, which is how do I take an ancient tradition that doesn't necessarily feel relevant to me and incorporate the ancient part and into a way that feels meaningful and modern. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we shouldn't, you shouldn't be modernizing. I'm saying there's also value in sort of the, the, this feeling of tradition that is deeper than like I just made it up. Like, you know, like I love a hippie. I love a hippie. Like it's sort of, they're my favorite. And I love that a lot of what hippie spirituality is, is just like, it's sort of organic in the moment. Like, oh, right now I'm going to, I'll go hug that tree and then I'll do hacky sack and then I'll meditate on a rock. All that stuff is beautiful. But sometimes you also want something that feels like it's connected to the past in some way. Not to say you should believe in things that feel like bullshit to you, but your blessing of our child is inspired by this ancient thing that doesn't necessarily feel relevant, but is still in the form of that old thing. And sometimes you need the um, the form. That's what's up. To then improv, like there can be no freedom without form. Yes. Was what they told us in acting school. Yes. So if you have the form, like oh, this is my Stanislavski method. Yep. Now, if I'm doing the tenets of the form, then I can have my freedom within it. Like I wouldn't just bless our child if Moshe wasn't going through the the wine and everything. And also, that's how you learn it. That's why it's good to go to the temple because then you can at least like. It's like so you're studying. Like, what do I want to bring into my family? Another amazing yeah. tradition that I love is the yurtzeit candle, which is on the on the evening of anyone who's died in your family, 
you light a candle and it's these little candles that you can light for 24 hours and you put it in a prominent place in your house and you gather and you talk about that person and you maybe make foods that they liked and you kind of keep them alive for the 24 hours. And I just think that's such a, like there was not, never anything like that in Christianity when I was that's growing beautiful. up. So yeah, so it just, there's just so many cool tools, but you know, and I was telling my sister who's not Jewish about that. And she was like, oh, I want to do that. And it's like, it's my dad's birthday or my dad's, uh, you know, anniversary of his death. And so now we're all doing that. And, and I think, you know, these, yeah, just these, these little things you can do, but you have to learn about them to be able to do them. Yeah. I'm with you. Oh, we got through it. Oh, and what's the name of that book? Which book? Is Sabbath. It called- Martin Buber. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. really like it because it's a short book and it's really beautifully written. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the thing about I think we can. I sit. also really liked Rabbi Nachman. Oh, Rabbi Nachman, yeah, mm. he's he's really good. I mean, it's like the, aphorisms and like really easily easily digestible. Um, he he kind of feels like a Buddhist or something when I read him. But there's like I mean, there's all these great wisdom traditions everywhere. Like I, you know, and I just think like they all are equal. Every one of them is equal, and they all have the same goal in mind. They're all yeah. What did you say? They're all windows different windows looking in at the same thing. Yep. Like that's just true. Yeah, uh, I totally get that. That makes sense. I just wanted to make sure that like this was appropriate, you know, like I don't want to offend anybody, I no, guess. Oh no. In, like, it's, exploring this side. It's you know? all, everything is appropriate. There are no rules. We're careening but towards should, the end anyway. Phones should, are going to kill us. But you should read the paper because this might not be the best time to be, um, converted. <laughs> <laughs> you should read the paper. <laughs> What I do to bless my daughter on Friday nights is I open up the paper and I read whatever is germane to the Jewish people at the time. I still read. I still read. You know, I, I don't read everything on my phone because I I believe the phones are going to. I mean, this us. honestly, I know this call is going long, but this honestly is one of the cool parts about losing your religion is that you then have this like tabla rasa to mm. to borrow from. You go, okay, what do what what am I into? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe I'm into no religion at all. But with maybe a kid, into, it's good to have something. Maybe I'm into all of them. Maybe I'm into a little from each. Maybe I decide I'm going to be a Buddhist. Maybe I, de- I mean, it's like, that's a real freedom that comes from like letting go of the, the thing about religion that can be haunting is when you come from a, a hardcore dogmatic version of religion and you find you don't believe in it anymore. But once you once you really release from the dogma of it, there's like, you could do whatever you want because nobody's watching. All right, we yeah. got to go. Yeah, we have to go. Bless you. Thank you. See you at 6th and I. Bye, Ryan. She was cute. What a what a, what a what an episode. We did it. It was tense. It was funny. It was philosophical. It was beautiful. Your tits were out. Then they were back in. You were a monster. It was all good. All right, listen. Well, uh, this has been great. It's been real. And, Hello, uh, real. honey. See ya. See you later. Do you know how we sign off on this podcast? I forgot. It's not see you later. <laughs> Do you want to try it? We'll give it a whirl. You're supposed to say it first. Hey, I love you. I love you too. <laughs>